Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stack Overflow Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Joel Spolsky. All right. Right after the last presidential election, a couple of days after that in 2016, um, marketer, a 35-year-old marketer in Austin, Texas, was walking around and he saw some buses. And he took some pictures of those buses and put them on Twitter. And these are the words that he wrote onto Twitter. He said, quote, anti-Trump protesters in Austin are not as organic as they seem. Here are the buses they came in. Hashtag fake protests. That was his tweet. And the tweet got shared by quite a few people. Uh, he only had about 40 people following him on Twitter, but the tweet very quickly went to about 16,000 people on Twitter, 350,000 people on Facebook, and then it really started to go viral. And it got picked up by uh, the subreddit, the Donald Trump subreddit, where the headline was, breaking, they found the buses. And eventually, the president-elect himself was complaining about the professional protesters. Now, this is sort of a bit of a bizarre conspiracy theory and a hard one to believe, even for hardcore conspiracy theorists, that somebody would pay to, to stage an artificial um, protest. Uh, and it wasn't true so much as um, completely fabricated. It's completely false. Uh, the buses were, it turns out, there for a tech software conference, much like this one. Uh, and uh, the, the story, however, did manage to spread very, very quickly um, because it sounded fun. Uh, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, this is sort of the tip of the fake news iceberg. And the fake news iceberg itself is only one of the many iceberg-like problems that the internet is raining down upon us uh, these days. Here's another one. And so that's sort of a social media problem. Here's a search engine problem. Uh, a few years ago, my doctor decided I should start taking statins, presumably for, to reduce my cholesterol. And around about the same time, I noticed that I was starting to get forgetful and having trouble remembering things. Where was I going with this? Oh, um, forgetfulness, right. And so I started to wonder, is there a connection between taking statins and forgetfulness? And what do you do when you're wondering if there's a connection between two things? You go on Google and you type statins forgetfulness. And what I found was 72,500 results. And for about 10 seconds, I was actually worried. Uh, and of course, that's not the real story, because what I was really forgetting is that you can find 72,000 results on Google for anything. 72,000 results on Google means no connection whatsoever, because the internet today contains every possible sequence of every possible sentence and every possible combination of sentences that you could possibly put together. And you could go Google right now, Joel Spolsky is a space alien, and I'll bet there are a million results for that as well. Uh, what, what I was missing, actually, is the real story, which is that statins have massively reduced incidences of heart attacks, and uh, down by 60 or 70 percent. And that's the real story, and you miss that because you search for the wrong thing, and search engines don't really help you, and that's kind of another problem with the state of the internet right now. And the kind of a much larger example of that, which I'm sure you've heard of, is that millions of people are now starting to convince themselves that vaccines cause autism, which, by the way, they don't. Um, and uh, this is causing a huge problem, and we're starting to see outbreaks of diseases that we already had a cure for in 1963, and that's a little bit depressing. And it's because you can kind of find anything you want on the internet. And I think these things, 2019 is going to be the year of the backlash uh, against uh, tech and the internet. And this is going to be the year we're all going to be reading a lot of op-eds. And the op-eds are going to be complaining about Facebook doing this thing and causing that thing. And the op-eds are going to complain about the 
stupid millennials with their stupid smartphones and how everybody is walking around looking at their phone all day long, but they're also really lonely and they're misinformed. And by the way, the Russians caused them to vote for the wrong person and all this horrible stuff, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I've been in the tech industry for about three decades now, so that entitles me to say two things. One, get off my lawn. And two, I actually kind of think that the net, there's a huge net positive here to the internet and that we've made a lot of progress and this stuff is really good uh, for us in general. Um, but that there are a lot of problems, and so I wanted to analyze those a little bit, and I wanted to see if there was something that we could do better. Uh, a lot of, a very limited number of giant Fortune 500 for-profit companies, maybe Google, Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, very small number of companies are actually able to shape and impact and control in some way an awful lot of the opinion and the thought and the speech that goes through the internet right now. And a lot of sort of society is kind of going through decisions that those, those companies are making right now. And there's a lot of it uh, that's up to them. And it's an interesting question is how those companies really make decisions. Um, it's a little bit ridiculous to even say that, but they're not democracies. Uh, and I don't think we expected them, a company to operate as a democracy, or we really needed them to operate as a democracy, they're just sort of, it's a kind of a take it or leave it basis. You either like what they're doing or, I don't know, don't use the internet. Um, and sometimes they do the right thing. For example, if you do Google vaccines autism right now, you will see that actually in that area, Google is doing the right thing. Uh, a lot of them do the wrong thing. And so an example of that, I don't even have to give you an example of that. Facebook on, on a weekday. Um, so I want to take one particular example of how these companies, which are not run as democracies, are, are really governed, and maybe there's a different way they should be governed. And uh, let's look at the example of free speech or free expression um, as one typical example, because that's going to be coming up um, a lot, because a lot of the speech that does happen, a lot of the expression that happens now happens on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, et cetera, where it's being governed in a non-democratic way. Now, I think we generally agree that free speech or free expression is a valuable thing to society and to democracy, and we need it. And I think we also generally agree that private companies don't actually have an obligation to provide it. Uh, that's, not, uh, that's not protected by the First Amendment. But if we support the First Amendment, that's because we like free speech and we like it for a reason. So let's try to figure out uh, what we need here. The first problem, I think, with free speech is uh, drawing lines. At some point, you really kind of have to figure out what you're going to allow. And this is what we might have thought of in college as the yelling fire in a crowded theater problem, which is even a hardcore free speech advocate doesn't think that all speech is necessarily going to be allowed. And that means that you do have to draw the lines at some particular points. If you're a tech company, you're running a business too. And you don't want to put up speech that's going to really cause a problem for the business and the advertisers necessarily. Some line has to be drawn. There is no version of a social network that's running uh, an absolutely, completely free speech um, platform, and that's okay. Um, but there is a gray area. Um, fake news, as I mentioned, is uh, going to be a real big gray area. Uh, I think that the type of fake news which you see all the time, which is that Brad and Jennifer are getting back together and they're going to have a baby, that's awesome. I see that all the time. It's not true, sadly. Um, but that's fake news that I can live with, personally. Fake news is just totally made up, however, and that starts to influence elections. There's another problem. Uh, another area I might take that's sort of interesting, uh, where it's hard to draw the line, is erotica or adult content. And a good example of that is that a couple of months ago, the um, formerly popular website Tumblr decided to ban all adult content. And this was somewhat hilarious because uh, they were not super successful at doing that. And they never really explained what they meant by adult content uh, that they were going to ban. Uh, they never really defined it. And so where do you draw the line? What about belly buttons? Do we allow belly buttons? Will those be permitted on Tumblr? Um, probably, right? I don't know. In some cultures, that would not be an acceptable form of 
content. And so as soon as you start trying to make these decisions, uh, you get into an awful lot of trouble. And then you get into another problem, which is even if you can make these decisions about whether or not to allow belly buttons, is that the scale of the problem is insane. You have billions of people posting billions of things on social networks all the time, and you can't police it all. You can try to hire a lot of moderators, and that's what these companies are doing. Uh, but it's not working very well. There's companies like uh, YouTube, which is owned by Google, and Facebook have literally hired tens of thousands of people. A lot of times, they're outsourced workers in call centers overseas. And their job is to respond to complaints and essentially to police all this kind of content. The rules are really bizarre, and there's a secret 1,400-page rule book, apparently, that Facebook moderators are supposed to be following. Nobody knows what it says, but the parts that we've seen appear to be full of gaps, biases, and outright errors. And then moderators have about 10 seconds to judge whether or not something should be allowed. And so the chances that a group of well-meaning people in Silicon Valley are really going to be able to correctly police speech on the internet and draw that line between admissible and inadmissible speech is vanishingly small. So what do we do? Um, I heard a talk last year from Matthew Prince, and Matthew is speaking here, by the way, tomorrow, so make a note to go listen to him. He's the CEO of Cloudflare. Um, Cloudflare is a cloud networking platform. They provide internet connectivity, basically. They used to think of themselves as we're just a pipe company. Our job is to transmit bits from point A to point B. We don't care how you interpret those bits or what they mean. Not our problem, none of our business. But one day, a bunch of Nazis pissed them off, and they decided to hell with it. You're Nazis, goodbye, we're not doing business with you. They kicked them off of the platform. And this caused a certain amount of turmoil internally inside the company. And a lot of people said, hey, if we're kicking them off for being Nazis, who's to say we shouldn't also kick off any of the other kinds of speech that we don't find admissible or, or acceptable? And now, all of a sudden, we're the speech guardians of the universe, and that's practically impossible. So what Matthew said, which I thought was really interesting, is that even before you can have these debates, and even before you start sitting around trying to decide what types of speech you're going to allow, you need something called due process, which I shall explain in a moment. You have to have due process or rule of law, or you can't really successfully decide whether to allow belly buttons or Nazis or whatever it is that you don't want to allow. And by the way, this is something that the existing social networks have gotten completely wrong. They do not have due process. I'll get to that. But let's define it really quickly. Due process consists of three components. Number one is transparency. I should be able to figure out what the rules are. If I don't know what they are, I should be able to look it up. It should be published. That's transparency. Number two is consistency. The rules shall apply equally to all people and in all areas. They should be applied consistency, whatever those rules are. You don't get sort of special exceptions whereby if you're the president, you're allowed to threaten people with bodily harm. The rules should apply to everybody equally. And finally, accountability, and this is an important part, which is that if you don't like the way the rule has been enforced, you should be able to appeal it. There should be a way to adjudicate it. There should be a, a, a process by which you get things uh, improved and fixed, and there should be a system for changing the rules when you don't like the rules. So that's not really democracy. That's kind of almost a lower bar, a much lower bar than democracy, and a lower bar than freedom of speech, which is let's get some um, rule, of, rule of law going. If you don't, if you leave these things out, all kinds of things go wrong, and you can see it because the social networks are leaving them out. So for example, when you don't have transparency, you get this amazing thing, which you see all the time, which is sounds like a, it's more than a conspiracy. It's almost like a conspiracy trope, which is, oh, they have a secret agenda they're not telling us. They are, it might be the mainstream media, when you hear those words, it's usually a complaint about somebody with a secret agenda, or the Silicon Valley elites with their weird crypto libertarian burning man agenda, who the heck knows what they're trying to do here to us, um, but they won't tell us, and they're obviously doing it because somebody's getting rich, or their financial agenda, or whatever. And all that comes from a lack of transparency, and the less transparency you have, the more fuel these conspiracy theories have to rage. When you don't have consistency, um, it makes it impossible to know what the policy is going to be. And so uh, it, it's just very hard sort of for society to work. The lack of consistency honestly leads to a lack of civilization in some ways. The fact that you know that you're allowed to make a right turn on red, and everybody knows that, and we all agree that, whether we want it to be allowed to make a right turn on red or not, it's allowed. 
Uh, and, and that's one of the things that makes civilization really work. And accountability is a really important one because accountability says if you don't like the way a decision was made, you know that you can appeal it ultimately. You can call your credit card company. Good luck calling YouTube if they take one of your videos. They don't even have a phone number. And without these things, people stop being engaged in the social network. And the reason when you're Facebook and YouTube, you have to hire 10,000 or 15,000 moderators is that your community can't do the moderating work for you. And they can't do the moderating work for you because there's no consistency and there's no transparency. And most of all, there's no accountability, so they don't care. And what you've created is a kindergarten where you have to babysit a bunch of spectators rather than a real community or a real civilization. So essentially, nobody's very happy about what's going on right now, least of all Facebook, which is hiring thousands of people, and YouTube has hired 10,000 people to watch videos on YouTube, which are probably the really bad ones, not the makeup tutorials, but the horrifying videos that have to be removed is what, what they're watching all day long, and that sounds extremely traumatic and terrible. Um, and so I have a sort of simple proposal, which is let's just get due process, let's get transparency, consistency, and accountability on the social networks. And when you start with that, these communities will moderate themselves and we'll get civilization. It's not going to be perfect because we're not really going to be able to agree on 100% of the rules, but we'll have a system and then we'll agree that the system is worth enforcing and that's what rule of law really means. Now, if you think I'm crazy or you think I'm a dreamer, or you think this is completely impossible, we've been doing this on Stack Overflow now for 10 years. We have transparency. You can find out what the rules are. We apply them almost entirely consistency. And best of all, there's a lot of accountability and there's ways to appeal and there's ways to discuss these things. And it's worked really well. And we've done, we've created a site with 130 million monthly visitors on Stack Overflow where there is uh, almost no moderators. We have less than a dozen people that actually work for us, and they're just here to kind of help the community themselves self-moderate, and that works really well for us. Now, we're not perfect, and there's a lot more that we could do for diversity and inclusion. There's a lot more we could do to be friendly to newcomers on Stack Overflow, but we have managed to create this resource with very high-quality content uh, in a universe where um, everybody else is sort of struggling um, through the process of transparency consistency and accountability. Thank you very much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Joel.